Anyway, so I welcome everybody who has joined us so far, and I hope more people will join uh, on our How to Survive talk for tonight on Black visual intonation. And I have the big, the great pleasure to speak with Arthur Jaffa, Fielding. Jaffa. Oh, sorry, Arthur Jaffa. And um, we know each other since a longer time, I will talk about it, but I will give a brief introduction first, and um, then we will start a conversation after this presentation, and then um, we're gonna go into Q&A, and uh, you're, everybody's welcome. You're now muted, but everybody's welcome to write questions in the chat, and we will look at it and, and try to, to open um, the plenum later. So I, I'm gonna just going to start with a presentation. Um, shortly speaking about Arthur Jaffer, um, he's born in Tupelo, Mississippi, and he first studied architecture uh, in, at the Howard University in Washington, D.C. And um, from another conversation, and there are a lot of online, and I recommend some of them, especially the film in the Louisiana channel, um, he was telling that actually his time in Los Angeles, also the contact with young African-American American, um, and African filmmakers from the UCLA that the University of California is lo at Los Angeles film program was kind of important from him because it was a younger generation uh, working on film. And um, he became a cinematogra cinematographer in, in his most famous uh, work there is probably from 1991, Daughters of the Dust by Julie Dash, uh, a great film on a um, African-American community around uh, the turn of the century from the 19th to the 20th century. And um, then he also worked with uh, Spike Lee on Crooklyn in 94 and uh, Isaac Julian, also very known British uh, video artist on Darker Shade of Black. And um, AJ is a big fan of Stanley Kubrick and he also succeeded in working uh, with him on his last film, Eyes Wide Shut. Um, I came to the work of Arthur Jaffa uh, in 2000 because I was living in the United States and he was included in the Whitney Biennial in 2000. And uh, it's two pieces, Yellow Jacket from 99 and Tree, uh, two short video pieces. And I'm gonna show Yellow Jacket in the following. So you get an impression. And they were very short pieces, kind of conversation pieces and um, very experimental in a way. Uh, and somehow, I was interested because it was something I didn't know. And uh, so I included in it in my show then and in my first show at the Westfälische Kunstverein in Münster uh, called Former Social. And um, in his career, uh, Jaffa then continued also with filmmaking and uh, found company with Malik Said uh, for a black independent film, uh, made documentaries uh, like uh, Dreams Are Colder Than Death, uh, commemorating Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech from 2013. The same year he did Apex and we're going to show an excerpt of, of this film and I consider it like a very important piece and I'm um, and we're going to talk about it also the way he, he works with music and images and collage montage uh, in his film work. Um, in the art world, he became very known um, when he had a show at Gavin Brown's Enterprise in New York. It's a New York gallery, uh, kind of famous and very artist driven in a way. And after the show, he was invited by Hans Ulrich Obris for a solo show at the Serpentine Gallery in London in 2017 with a very nice title, a series of utterly improbable yet extraordinary renditions. Uh, and it traveled also, I was happy to see it in Stockholm, which I think was the last station of it. Um, then, of course, uh, Love is a Message, The Message of Death from 2016. It's kind of a breakthrough, especially because it's a, uh, it premiered after, a few days after the US presidential election, and it was uh, uh, together with Kanye West's gospel-inspired song, Ultralight Beam. So it became very famous, even also like Kenya West, you know, like he wanted to become president and then retire. So there was a lot of, you know, like media things around it also that made it very prominent. And but it's also a great piece and it was uh, screened by so many museums in so many places. So that's probably the most known 
uh, work uh, by Jaffa uh, at the moment. Then he worked with further music view videos for Beyoncé, Solange, and Jade Z. So there's a very strong link to, to black music and black musicians as well. In 2019, uh, he received the Golden Lion at the Venice Biennial as Best Artist uh, for his piece White Album from 2019. So that's just to introduce him as a short you know, outline and we talk about the content later. So this is just like a short biography with some uh, aspects of his work. And um, so we're gonna switch into Yellow Jacket, uh, a very early piece from 1999. And I'm just gonna show it shortly. I hope this works. So this was like the early piece, we're gonna talk about it later, but I also wanna show an excerpt of Apex, which is much later piece from 2013. And I have to warn a little bit because there are also images of violence. Um, so, but um, you know, the, the whole film is eight minutes and 20. And I think it's, um, it's very important to know that usually uh, um, AJ is not screening things online because it's really usually projected in the space and you go in the space and you have the music loud and you have the, the images really in front of you. Um, so we just do it now for, for, you, for you to get to know a little bit, but um, yeah, it's only a short excerpt. Okay, so thank you for um, AJ that we could were able to show this and I just end with this images, two images, one is uh, called Monster, it's a self portrait, uh, portrait from 1988, which was also on the poster for at least for the Moderna Museum showed. And on the right, we have a 
one of his sketchbooks, so, so to say, which is in the collection of MoMA, where you can see, you know, that there's a big collection of images uh, Jaffa always works on, and somehow it's also the principle, the way he works with montage and uh, puts all things together all the time and collects it and has a huge archive, out of which also Apex was uh, generated. So I'm going to stop the... Um, how can I do this? Okay, wait, 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 wait. How can I stop this? So, okay, excuse me. So we can be bigger now. Okay, and I welcome again Arthur Jaffa. And I thought I was looking at lots of talks and somehow I came across this. Uh, perhaps we can start with that. Um, you know, when you talk, uh, when you look at Yellow Jacket, you have this impression of you know, there's this homeless pe person on the street with his yellow jacket and it's somehow nothing more, but already it tells so much. And you were talking about a lot about alienation. And I remember the story that you said you were born in Tupelo, uh, but you somehow grew up in Clarksdale and your parents were teachers and you were always in between these two places, which were very different. So this kind of um, not belonging, alienation, um, so my question is really, is that, you know, this alienation, is this like very central to you and did it change over time uh, with your film work that you feel different or it's not such a big motor anyway, anymore, sorry. Um, no, I don't, I, I don't know, it's hard, it's hard to parse how different I feel. I don't, I don't, I mean, I feel like I feel now, <laughs> you know what I mean? So. And I don't, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think it's that big, that different, you know, I mean, more than anything, I think, obviously, over the years, um, I've come to think about that alienation in a certain kind of way. It's not that I'm less alien or more alienated. I just think about it differently. I mm -hmm. certainly have spent quite a bit of time trying to articulate it or describe it, the effect of it. Uh, but you know, also too, sometimes when you figure out how to describe something, um, anything really, a concept, an object, a feeling, when you describe it, it fixes it in a way. So you know what I mean? So I can describe the sort of phenomena of moving back and forth between these two, uh, you know, really different sort of environments, even though they both were in the South and they both were in Mississippi, which for many people is one thing, you know what I mean? That's just one thing. But, yeah. And surely they probably shared more things than they, they were more alike than they were different, particularly mm -hmm. more alike uh, than different, you know, uh, from other places, let's say, for example. So you're talking about the South, Mississippi in particular, more or less northern Mississippi, more or less the, the top half of the state. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the late 60s, early 70s, which also is a very particular moment in time. Mm -hmm. Not just a particular moment in time, but it has a particular distance from, you know, the sort of height of the civil rights movement and things like that. And then proceeding or concurrent with the civil rights movement, the sort of um, typical or sort of uh, characteristic violence, both you know, psychic and physical of that terrain, that environment. So, you know, so they both share, had a shared proximity, tem temporarily speaking, from that particular moment, that height of that moment in time. So, you know, so there are many things about it that are very, very, very similar, but. Obviously, as I said, moving back and forth between the two, I became particularly uh, cognizant, or I felt, I couldn't really articulate it so much when I was a teenager, you know what I mean? But, uh, but fairly early on, I sort of kind of got a little bit of a handle on it. And I realized that, I mean, even if you use the term like alienation, you know, it typically gets used in a certain kind of way. So it sounds like, uh, inherently sort of de derogatory or maybe negative mm -hmm. sort of assessment. And I'm not sure I necessarily feel like that. I mean, I, I probably wouldn't use the term alienation so much um, because first of all, it's so it's broad in a way, if you say alienation, it's very, very broad. And I think there's a certain aspect of black life 
in the context of the U.S. where that's a given. And I'm not sure the term itself is quite sufficient to describe the particularities of it and the specificities of how it plays out in various locations inside the U.S. But having said that, what I was mostly trying to speak to was the sense that uh, that I, I found myself not feeling only partially belonging. Maybe it was another definition of alienation. Only I, I felt like I mean, the kind of embeddedness that people, sense of embeddedness that they have when they're produced by a particular context, uh, NATO context of some sort, uh, I didn't really kind of have that or was very sort of disrupted or very destabilized by the fact that I was moving back and forth between these two places that were so different in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly both characterized by a kind of asymmetrical power, you know, relations between Black folks and white folks for sure. That would be typical mm -hmm. of both environments, but um, the flavor of it, so to speak, in Tupelo was very different from the flavor of it in, um, in Clarksdale, where in Clarksdale it was much more um, kind of explicit, you know, um, like segregation, which was on the books, no longer legal and no longer in effect, but in real terms, it was very much a segregated environment, as was Tupelo, but but Tupelo, it just was very different because they had made certain concessions to, um, you know, the legislation, the legislative changes that uh, had sort of been implemented. Um, and whereas Clarksdale had, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But on the other side, Clarksdale seemed to me in some ways a much clearer or much more transparent environment to operate in, especially as a young person, you know what I mean? Whereas I think looking back on it, there was something uh, false about Tupelo's sort of presentation of racial mm -hmm. solidarity, which really, really didn't, yeah, I mean, it didn't hold at all with the actual power dynamics, you know, so. And uh, so, so at the end of the day, it just felt like a much, I felt like in some ways, despite Clark still being in the environment, like I, I sort of joke when we always say it was uh, equal parts, the Brady Bunch and the color purple, you know, so. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. It was in some ways a truer environment, I think, to grow up in, yeah, for me at least. Yeah, and I remember that you were showing me images of these joints, you know, where people come and make music or buy things, and uh, that that was kind of important, the way a wall would, for example, look in a joint, or, uh, you know, like these meeting places where all kinds of information comes together, and uh, when we first met in, in 2000 or 99, I can't remember, um, I remember that already this principle of collage montage, it's like things coming together in a natural way, kind of black aesthetics, that was something you were looking for, you know, was very important for you at the time. So, and also the influence of music, of course, you know, like in, in Tupelo. So um, perhaps you could talk a little bit like how you, you know, like how you try to find first you kind of your aesthetics or what were you after or what, what were the consequences of growing up there and becoming an artist in a way? <laughs> consequences. Um, I don't know. I mean, like I said, I can just talk all day about it without, I don't know. I get, I guess I, because oftentimes when I talk, like people always say, have you prepared for a talk? And I was like, no, I stopped preparing for her talks 20 years ago, just because I didn't, I couldn't see any appreciable difference between the ones I prepared for and the ones I didn't. So yeah. <laughs> just one less thing to do, but I try to, I try to sort of go into the talks with no real agenda. I mean, obviously you have an agenda because whether conscious or not, you're invested in certain narratives about yourself or narratives about mm -hmm. how you landed up but one of the things i do like about talks and you know as opposed to lectures like people have approached me and said like can you do a lecture and i was like i never do lectures <laughs> but i do go i do go and talk and i tend to just you know as they say in hip-hop off the domes just off the top of my head so sometimes it's influenced by what I'm thinking about currently, but other times it's just, you know, it's a shtick. It's a little bit of a shtick too, because these are the things that I kind of sort of arrived at. And, you know, oftentimes it's just easier just to re them. You know, it makes, it makes me really self-conscious because again, 
talks at their best to me are fluid, you know, but because everything is recorded now mm-hmm. and everything, and then, then not, not just recorded, but then it's like posted. So I'm constantly in a sense, I mean, I would say the same kind of destabilization or the same kind of cognitive dissonance that was caused by moving back and forth between Tupelo and Clarksdale is caused by me knowing that all, that, that all these alternate universe versions of me I hear voicing many of the same things, some of which I still believe, some of which I don't, you know, like people will ask me things sometimes and I say, they will say, you know, do you think this, this and that? And I'll say, yeah, I believe it. I say it's it's both like no longer true. I mean, it's true, but I don't, I no longer believe it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, uh, but that kind of, I mean, at the end of the day, I think what I'm talking about is when you have spaces with a certain kind of built-in polarity or by, uh, maybe a binary opposition of sorts. And when you're moving through, it's something to me about, there's something characteristic or fundamental about this state, state of in-betweenness. Mm-hmm. And that kind of in-betweenness is uh, can get talked about in different ways. I think it's a fundamental aspect of being Black American or being African American. I mean, the in between is between African and American. You know, depending on what you mean by African, and depending on what you mean by American, that's a, at best a very um, contentious relationship between those things. So the whole idea that you are this thing that is in a certain kind of perpetual flux, you know, it's like being a griffin or a chimera, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You're like an eagle. I mean, you're a lion with eagle's wings and, you know, a beak or something like that. So I think that aspect of maybe it's the existential aspect of Afro-American or Black being, I guess I would say, is uh, more defined by a flux between two states or multiple states than it is by the states in and of themselves. So, and this is just, at the end of the day, it's just another aspect of the phenomenon that, uh, you know, Du Bois termed double consciousness, or as mm-hmm. I like to say sometimes, trouble consciousness, because it's not just two polarities that we're talking about, we're talking about, and that kind of lack of, or uh, it, it, maybe even a refusal at this point, but that being in between these states is as much as anything like an ontological frame for blackness, you know what I mean? This in between this, this sort of a nation with no land. That's a, you know what I mean? It's like the things that stabilize identities and stuff like for black folks, the thing that's most characteristic of black identity, if you want to call it as such, is the sort of instability of it you know what i mean there's something mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. the perpetual instability of it as a state of being that i think is probably a signature uh, aspect of it so in as far as like i mean i remember i literally i know the conversation that we had i remember this conversation it's like a kind of emblematic conversation for me i was literally sitting in my grandmother's house in tupelo I can still remember the living room. I mean, it wasn't the living room. It was a den where the television was when we were having a conversation. And that's why I know it really struck me because it brought it brought something, it crystallized something because I know the part I remember distinctly is I was sharing with you that book, Jib Joint, which you, you mm-hmm. were referring to, Bernie Eames photography of like social spaces in the sort of Mississippi Delta in the I think it was like the late 70s, early 80s is yeah. when he took most of the photos. It's a really an amazing book. Mm-hmm. And it was to me such a profound repository of these aesthetic values, which typically would be understood as being uncodified, like they weren't codified aesthetic values. But I was fascinated by the fact that here was this evidence that you could see that it was a kind of, I used to say there's a sort of unauthored, uh, invention going on there. Like there was no author, mm-hmm. but nevertheless it was. And I remember saying to you, this is what I aspire to. And I remember you saying like, you said, no, you can't do that though. And I was like, why do, what do you mean I can't do it? He said, because what you're attracted to is the fact that it's not authored, that it's not designed, that it's not engineered. And I was like, yes, of course I can. 
just <laughs> because mm -hmm. I've set it as a goal. As soon as you see it as a goal, and I, I remember saying to you, like jazz is a perfect example of it because it's a structure designed and engineered to produce indeterminacy. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's designed to produce an un unengineered ad hoc effect. So I was right. like, yeah, of course you can. And then I think, you know, it also has something to do with aesthetics, so to speak, so to speak, aesthetics or values or beauty or whatever, you know, maybe maybe aesthetics is too top loaded a word, too, too burdened a word, but values of beauty and continuity of those values of beauty that sort of got produced from circumstances that were not of one's choosing, let's say, meaning mm -hmm. Black people or African people find themselves in this forge, this cauldron, you know, America, and it produces Blackness. Because I don't think when African people arrive in America, they're not, they're not Black people, they're African people. But at some point, there was a woman who herself was African who gave birth to a child that was Black when she herself was not Black. I mean, it's just another version of the typical immigrant experience you see, like first, second versus third generation immigration. You know what I mean? Like the people who arrived there from the West Indies in London, they're in London, they're in the UK, but they're still West Indians. But at some point, it may take one generation, it may take two generations, but at some point, those kids, uh, they're going to still be West Indian, but not in the way their parents are West Indian. They're going to be like fundamentally different by the context in which they, you know, developed. And so it's the same thing. It's just that in the case of African peoples who found themselves in the Americas, that natural process of evolution that happens when people resituate themselves, when there's a sort of you know, a uh, boundaries got crossed in terms of migration and stuff and a, and a profound transposition happens. In the case of black people, the, proud, the, the transposition was extreme because mm -hmm. it was coming from being, being of a sort, maybe not human beings in the Western sense, but certainly beings, cognizant, sentient beings who then find themselves in a context where everything is saying to you, you're not, you're not sentient, you're not a being, you're certainly not a citizen, and you're certainly not a human being, right? Of the various types of beings that you could be. You're not a human being. And that not being a human being is just another version of this extreme polarity I'm talking about, from both being a human and not being a human. And in a way, the kind of, it's like almost the premier or one of the most premier aspects of blackness is being in this interstitial uh, in between state between the classic subject and object. You know, we're both an object and a subject at the same time. I mean, the subject is being a subject in the context for African people in the Americas is very contentious. I mean, the whole context of saying that you're not a subject, mm -hmm. saying you're an object, but there's something Im imminent and inherent about being a sentient being. So you're, you know, we, so we are like in between, like constantly in between. So you know, I used to always say, like, if you look at John Coltrane, like he's playing my favorite things, like over and over, he recorded that song more than probably any other song that he recorded. And you know, and you would say, oh, it's not simply John Coltrane took, you know, Rodgers and Hammerstein, Julie Andrews, the Here's Our Live with the Sounds of Music, all the baggage of that, and transformed it. Because if you look at his performances of it, he always starts off with the recognizable version of it. And then he goes out, as they say this week, mm -hmm. he goes out. Mm -hmm. But unlike, like, well, maybe with free jazz, he always circles back. <clears throat> and it's the circling back, I think, is important because what he's, what I think he and his collaborators were getting at, that it wasn't necessarily simply like going from state A to state B. It was about the flux of the space in between the two. And that's why it's circling that way. And that circularity is completely bound up with fundamental aspects of black being and double consciousness and all this other kind of stuff that, you know, people way smarter than me have, uh, you know, mapped out and, and articulated. So, so I think a lot of that is that play in the work, even with something like Yellow Jacket, like the blur itself is just another technical, formal, technical version of that. I mean, the refusal of like 
you know, split between point and wave, like in say, you know, like in quantum mechanics, like is light a wave or is it a particle? Well, yeah, you know, black so, folk, folks yeah. is both. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're covering uh, ground, and I don't know how fast, but I try to 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 get uh, to some question again because. Um, Somehow with Coltrane, you're also saying there is a kind of surface or perhaps it's a melody, but what you do then is like you get into a travel and you get far out, but somehow you always, you know, like you need the identity, but you need to reach out, but you have, you're always in between. So that's like this feature of, of jazz perhaps also. And um, what I was thinking also, I mean, I was remembering when we met that you, I said like, oh, you gonna come on Saturday, join me for like, like, let's look at some galleries. And you said like, oh, I'm not, I'm not going very often. I said like, why that? And you said like, well, they're not, no, you know, they're not black people around. So it was a little bit exaggerated, but somehow it felt also, you know, I wasn't aware because coming from Germany, of course I was aware that there were not so many big people, but um, you know, and also the discussion I had was putting yellow jacket in that show and everybody at Bart said, you cannot put it in a room apart. And I said, come on, it's a video. It needs a dark space. And they said, no, you're, you know, you cannot put the black artists in the space. I remember this kind of discussion, which for me were very strange because I looked at mm -hmm. the piece and um, anyway, and I asked you and you were okay with this, but what I'm saying is that, you know, what you're also saying, there's always like this double thing going on. And I wonder whether that can be also an advantage in terms of being an artist, because artists, you know, like making things strange is something that art does, you know, give you different views on thing. And perhaps you as a black person, I don't know, it's just a hypothesis. I don't know if you agree, but somehow you're already in a state that you're always also inside and outside and you look at things differently and perhaps it can be like an advantage. And I think you're doing it that you empower yourself in, you know, like rendering that view, you know, also with Apex, you know, you have the whole history of black and white people, mm -hmm. you know, and the relationship of it. So do you think that I you mean, have- is there, a history, is there a history of black people that's independent of the history of white people? I don't, I don't know that it exists. No, but perhaps it could be an advantage to be there also. You know, like what I see now is uh, like- art. Advantage just like, you know, I mean, we can say the word advantage versus disadvantage, but what I would say in response okay. to just that aspect, cause you're saying a lot mm -hmm. of things uh, is, uh, you know, it depends on what you consider advantage, you know, or disadvantage. Like, it's kind of like, mm, Not well, in some terms, but in terms of, uh, you know, like being an artist and having like, a, you know, like a viewpoint, like a specific viewpoint that can help you, like being and having a perspective. That Black artists have always had viewpoints, but maybe they didn't have careers. You know what I mean? Okay. So okay. you have a viewpoint and you don't yeah. got a career because you, no, can't, you're right. yeah. you can't get into the space. So, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, it's like a thing that like, you know, in one context or from one van, uh, perspective, it's a disadvantage, but maybe in another perspective, it's an advantage. I mm -hmm. mean, mm -hmm. I mean, I think also a big aspect characteristic that you see of Black being is like a kind of, you know, the transformation of so-called disadvantages into advantages. Or I like to make this joke, like, it's like how you make a deficit, an asset, or like you create what I call a deaf asset, you know? <laughs> so this is, I know that translates there, yeah, a deaf asset, but wow, uh, that's that's uh, it's just funny to me because I just think so often, you know, like, I mean, fundamentally, I think, like, I have this thing sometimes I say, like, we meaning, and now I mean Black artists, but I also mean probably everybody, but definitely Black artists have a certain, there's an ethical component to what I'm going to say, which is that, I, I like to say, we, we have to mine the catastrophe. Like, we have to mine it, because the catastrophe has already, already happened, the catastrophe mm -hmm. of our being, our, like, Black ontology is ontology or history of catastrophe. So we've already been in the catastrophe, are still in the catastrophe. And like in a way, it's like, you know, if a parent sacrifices himself for the life of the child, like to run away from that as opposed to interrogating that or taking the bones and figuring out what you can do with the bones, you know what I mean? Like that's important. I mean, I have a sort of ethical stance about that. So there are things that are in my work 
that might make certain people uncomfortable, might make certain black people uncomfortable. And that's all right. I don't mind it making people uncomfortable. I don't, you know, and people can have whatever opinion they have about it. But for me, it really is completely bound up with my sense of there's an imperative to to be like sort of in a sense, it's a kind of radical, radically conservative. It's like, I'm not gonna bury the bodies of my dead. I'm gonna eat the bodies of my dead or something like that. I'm gonna consume the bodies of my dead, you know? Because I want to, yeah, maybe everybody dust unto dust, everybody becomes dust ultimately. But my thing is like, I want to consume their bodies so my bodies will process their bodies before they become dust or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, like, I want to really figure out how to make the most possible use of our experiences, the horrible ones and, uh, you know, majestic ones. I don't, I don't, in some ways, I would say I'd rather have good experiences than bad experiences, but in some ways, and as far as like what we collectively have experienced, I don't make any distinction between the good ones and the bad ones because ultimately I don't feel like in terms of who we are, you can separate the two. I don't think like, you know, I've said this a million times, but if some deity said, hey, AJ, it's on you. You can snap your fingers and every horrible thing that ever happened to people of African descent in the Americas, you could snap your fingers and none of it would have ever happened. Well, I can't really do that like Thanos. You know, it's like Thanos or something. Mm -hmm. If I do that, we just literally cease to exist. If I have the gauntlet on my hand and I say, boom, every horrible thing that ever happened to African people, me and everybody else is immediately erased from existence because we only exist inside of the equation of those things that happen. Mm -hmm. And that's like a dilemma. That's a profound philosophical uh, dilemma, maybe spiritual dilemma, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not that undifferent from like, you know, people who weaponize rape and war and stuff because they understand that when military rape women, you know, from the people that they're fighting with, it creates this internal dissonance that can ever, I mean, it's very difficult to completely reconcile it. Some societies, structure, cultural structures are better at reconciling it than others. Like I would say one thing that's, I think, true or characteristic of black folks, which is that we don't situate being in the body. Mm -hmm. I mean, even though in fact, we are preeminent in, in the way the body functions because in some ways we've been forced to be because we're temporally marked we're marked in society by our bodies. Nobody's saying, I don't like what that person thought or what that person thinks, so I'm going to be prejudiced against them. The mm -hmm. first marker of it is that you don't look like us and that you're Black and you, your whole, even on a kind of physiognomic level, you are not us. You are not human. You are not human beings. And so we, of course, are hyper aware of our bodies. There's more hair salons in Black neighborhoods than anywhere else per you know, face of the earth. So we're hyper aware of what we look like. Yeah. But philosophically speaking, I don't actually think we situate being in the body. So say, for example, for a person to be black, but have a non-black parent, that's like, that's us. That ain't nothing. That's just like a black person with a Vietnamese parent or a black person with a German parent. You know what I mean? It don't make you any less black. It just means both your parents aren't black, so-called mm -hmm. black. But that's not a... That's not complicated for us to do because in some ways, I mean, I think there are probably some precedents for it that even preceded, like in Africa, there are precedents for it. But undoubtedly, the context of African experiences in the Americas forced us to create and understand familial connection outside of blood bonds, outside of genetic bonds. Yeah, we do have genetic bonds, the body, but if you're in a situation where you can't, you don't have self-determinacy around the coherency of your families and your relations with people, then you have to come up with another definition, another conception of kinship. Mm -hmm. It's why I'm really interested in like, you know, Judith Butler's work around kinship in the LGBT gay cos cosmology, because it's not a kinship that can be based 
on blood in the same way that typically families are. And in, in that way, uh, a lot of her insights, I think, have been very uh, fruitful for me to think about because I think, again, mining the catastrophe is like a horrible experiment that should have only happened on paper, but it happened in real time. So we can look at the real time implications of it. And one of the things that you do see is like this sort of almost oppositional obsession with body, but at the same time, understanding that, you know, body is not situated in the being because so much of our ontological frame is just a product of rape. So if that's the case, like you, it just forces you to come up with certain workarounds just because if not, you'll be looking in the mirror and hating yourself. Because if you look at pictures of Africans and you look at people, pictures of Black Americans, obviously we look different. I mean, it's a generalization, but yeah, we kind of look different. So that means that if you look in the mirror, you see the face of your rapist when you look in the mirror. So you got to have a different kind of conception of self-love in the face of that. It's got to be disconnected from the body or else you will never be able to come to terms with yourself. So I just think those things get played out on so many different levels. Mm -hmm. And But on the other hand, you know, like it's not on the other hand, it's the same, but you know, there's this big tradition, history, culture, you know, of black music, jazz. I mean, American music doesn't exist without black music or it is almost- It is black same. music. It, <laughs> it, it is, is black, black music. music. Yeah, so exactly. you're, as an artist, you're also kind of, you know, like with the culture and also, you know, like with, in Apex, you see it, you know, the violence that is always there um, and that is connected to the body and to suffering and so, and this disconnection, I don't know if art can be, you know, like also a tool or, you know, this idea of empowerment. So how do you relate to it as an artist? You know, is there, is there, you know, like when you do Apex, you have a big archive and you collect a lot of images that are not, you know, like, created by you, but collected by you in, in, in the montage. So I wonder whether, you know, that is kind of a way not out of the dilemma that will always exist, but of course it talks about the dilemma and that's a way to go about it. Which dilemma? Because <laughs> that was well, one, the one. Right. Which yeah. one? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the dilemma yes. of being an artist and being ground in, a, in an art history of, you know, like, suffering and rape that you are describing you know like you're working as an artist out of this history also and you're always referring to it right and this history is already you know like uh bound to this story you know like so you know gospel all this history is already you know what siesta is doing with the black monks of mississippi it really comes from this history and he's kind of reenacting it and doing his own thing out of it so i'm wondering yeah. If how well, you look, yeah. nobody's operating outside of history, everybody's inside of history. There's no yeah, such thing as operating outside of history, yeah. obviously. Yeah. So, I mean, like, so what do you do as an artist? What is the I do know? what I do? <laughs> well, right. I don't know what you mean. What do you do? I do what I do. I mean, part of which is this conversation. This is part of what I do. Mm -hmm. Mostly, I'm just making things. I'm not sitting back saying, let me see if I can make something that is like me going back and forth between Clarksdale and Tupelo. I don't say that. Mm -hmm. I have framed that as what I'm doing, but I don't really sit down and think, okay, how do I come up with something, you know, that's like, that is, you know, that is in some ways paradigmatic of that. I don't, I don't often do that. Um, I have worked really hard to give full reign to my intuitive thing. You know, I try to just be intuitive about stuff. Uh, more often than not, it's by recognizing something as opposed to pre preconceiving something. You know, you recognize something that's interesting. Uh, I am very resistant to this archival frame that I feel like has been like put on top of me. Like I'm kind of like, that's like saying pain is a geological because people use pigments in them. You know what I mean? It's just like kind of, yeah, kind of. But like when it comes to film, what's not archival? If you make films, it's archival. Oh, well, it doesn't have to be. You could make a film that was like, which I'm working on now anyway, just kind of completely generated from, you know, you know, bits. Like it's just all digital and it's not really sort of, but classic filmmaking 
where somebody pointed the camera at something, even if they pointed a camera at a drawing, like an animation, it's always archival in that respect. I never think like something like Love is the Masters or Eighth X, I don't think they are products of archives. Unless you mean life is an archive, in which case I would say, yeah, but if that's true, then what's not an archive? That means what's the point of using the term if it's just gonna be like ubiquitous, you know what I mean? It doesn't mean anything. Yeah, life is archival for sure. But when people say archives in any kind of classic sense of archive, which means a repository that has boundaries, that are police, there's no such thing as archive, classically speaking, that doesn't have a police ordered boundary. Someone who dictates what goes in and what goes out and what the people who visit it, what their relationship is gonna to be to accessing the products or the things that the archive contains. And typically speaking, once something enters an archive, it never leaves an archive unless something catastrophic happens like the building burn down or something like that. But like YouTube is not that at all. There's no gatekeeper. All you gotta do is give somebody your name and you can both post and, and, and erase things that, that you posted. So often with YouTube, things that you see if you come back, those things are gone. There's so many incredible things that are in my mind. Like I still remember to this day, like the first year that I was on YouTube, early in YouTube, there was this clip of Ike and Tina Turner from this mm -hmm. documentary in Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, strictly because of the limits of the buffer, right? The image used to stick, it used to stick in a certain kind of way. Meaning they'll be moving and then they'll be like this pausing. Well, it's like still the most amazing thing that I've ever seen in my life to completely actualize things that are at the core of my sort of aesthetic proposition about how to manipulate movement and things. But by the time I figured out how to record off of YouTube, they had upgraded their buffer because in the <laughs> beginning, you know, they didn't know it was going to be as big a success as it was. And so they had to do. They, had do, they were doing all these technical things, so images didn't stick. So now I have the footage, but it doesn't stick because I never got it recorded. Like one of my grand ambitions is to go back and talk to an engineer from, you know, from uh, YouTube from the first five years and say, what were the technical parameters of your buffer and how did it act the way it acted? Because I want to run this footage through that I have and replicate that effect of that Ike and Tina Turner thing that is itched in my brain, but I have no copy of it. So I, I say all this just to say, that's not an archive. That's not an archive by any mm -hmm. conventional definition of an archive. So it can be a know, that's like definition. saying a musician is archival the practice in itself is inherently archival because you're using notes that preceded. You know what I mean? You're using the A flat or B sharp. That note existed. It already existed in so many zillions of other things. Or hip hop is archival because they sample other things. Well, musicians always sample notes anyway. Anytime a composer says this note versus that note, they're using a note that's already been produced. And they're putting those pre-existing notes in some sort of relationship to each other, right? That's all I'm doing in Apex. So I don't, or or almost anything I've done. So I don't understand. It's just lazy to me when people say it's archival. It's something that sort of gathered a sort of traction, mm -hmm. you know, or it's archival because he's using footage that he didn't shoot. You know, he's using found footage. But even with something like Love is the Message, half the things that people think are found footage are things that I shot. They just look like found footage because at the end of the day, everything is found. I mean, unless you animated and then filmed it, 99% of everything that's filmed is found. by the day. That's what a camera is. A camera is a device to record what you find in life. You point it at a thing so that you can record that thing, but that thing pre-exists you pointing the camera at it, or its, it's existence is independent of you pointing the camera at it. So, so I'm a little, I get a little, I mean, I get what people are saying, but I hear so much that it's just, it, it's sort of, it's like a person just touching like this lightly, but after 2,000 times, I'm just like a little irritated by it, actually. So, mm -hmm. And I generally don't care what people think in general, but that is one that really, Kind of wrote me a little bit wrong. So and, and I think it obscures certain aspects of what I'm doing. Mostly that. That's my problem. It obscures aspects of what I'm trying to get at. So. Mm -hmm. And what was it? Was what was so fascinating for you in this buffering of Ike 
uh, and Tina Turner. Is it something that you describe like the blur in Jello Jacket that it's- Well, it's less, it's less the blur because the blur is an instance of technically speaking, mm -hmm. a recording of a sort of uh, extended moment in time. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's the wave versus the particle. That's kind of what it comes down to. Like I was saying to somebody recently, like at the end of the day, the two artists like, you know, who preceded me, who I think ultimately have had the most formal, formal, not formal, have not necessarily the most ethical impact on my practice, but, but the most formal impact on my practice are uh, clearly Miles Davis and Cecil Taylor. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, those are two rec irreconcilable. <laughs> I mean, they're both masters and they're both great, but I think Miles is a wave person and Cecil is a particle person. So it speaks to something of my personality that those would be the two individuals that I'm mostly drawn to. And they're so in a certain way, uh, incompatible, like kind of incompatible. Mm -hmm. But if you look at Miles's thing, he makes waves, long distended notes, right? But then he creates space between those notes. So it's in a way trying to make a wave into a particle. Where Cecil does these dense clusters of particles, the piano is the particle instrument par excellence because it's completely bound up with Western ideas, you know, Cartesian ideas of how the world gets broken up and all of that. And that's like a black person playing an instrument that was designed with a completely alien logic system and trying to make it into something was never, or use it in a way it was never intended to be used, frankly, you know. Um, but so with something like Yellow Jacket, like that blur is because as opposed to doing a quick shot like this and that person does one action in the shot, it's like you open the, the sensor or the, you know, the camera, you expose the film to light and the person does this, boom, mm -hmm. and then it closes down. So you got all of that mm -hmm. in one frame, that's a blur. Mm -hmm. So uh, I lost my train of thought there a little bit, but, um, but I was asking why, you know, like, why is this buffering, is the turn of piece? Oh, the buffering was interesting yeah. because um, what it did was the effect of it when you saw it was as opposed to Tina Turner moving like this, she would go, mm -hmm. it would be these staccato pauses. And they were beautiful to me. I mean, it's just the same thing like just doing. It doesn't matter to me if it's an accident. I don't really care if it was an accident. What matters to me is that I recognize it as something not only beautiful, but something worth replicating, something worth figuring out how to bring it into the realm of my arsenal of things that I can do intentional, like with intentionality. And in some ways, the goal is always to figure out how to do these things intentionally with the same effect that they had on you when they happened unintentionally, mm -hmm. but they don't seem like nobody put their hands on them. It just seemed like some random, incredible, miraculous accident, you know, some miraculous like sequence of notes that just happened. Feedback, you plugged in your guitar and you thought you were just gonna hit such and such chord, but when you hit that chord, the signals, you know, it does all this stuff you didn't really intend for it to do, but Jimmy Hendrix's whole practice is based on trying to wield, to wield that chaotic aspect of his system, to wield it expressively. So that's the same thing with me. It's just like, hey, that was a cool effect. It was 20 years ago now, and I still think about it, you know, along with like two or three other things that I didn't document that to this day will haunt me. I'm sure if in fact, our lives are virtual reality and when we die, we can go back and revisit any instance. I got a pretty good idea of the instances I'm gonna go back and revisit because of things that I just didn't record. Like I had somebody called my cell phone once, when, we, when not my cell phone, I didn't even have a cell phone. Oh, I did have a cell phone, but very, very early, they called my answering machine and they left a message on my phone. And it was like, I don't know if like, you know how sometimes people will call you, it's a pocket call, they don't know it's a call. So mm -hmm. their phone, they left a message on your answer thing and it's recording and it's in their pocket. I don't really know what this sound was, okay. Okay. but it was this sound that was like, it had this effect. And I remember for like a week walking around playing it for people on my phone. I was like, look at this, this is the most incredible thing I've ever heard in my life. 
And then the phone company cleared it off of my, you know, I just kept saving it and they cleared it. And I was called the lawyer, all kinds of stuff, trying to figure out if I could get them to go. You know, I was like, it's, in the, it's somewhere in the system. <laughs> that will be a, a place I'll revisit, like, you know, in the afterlife, because I want to hear that again. I don't think I was tripping. I know I wasn't tripping because I played it for multiple people, and they all say, yeah, this is really kind of incredible. But it's a great loss, you know, because I have no idea how to replicate it at all. So. Yeah. yeah, it's like going back to the to the digital. Um, yeah. And I'm, I want to make cut and ask you, we are seeing all this, you know, like this um attention to black artists in the in the art market you know like uh a numbers going high for artists that have for a long time being there and in this flipping of black artists work and um so I, i i feel always like a little bit uneasy especially also you know like like in in uh in in museums here in germany where you you know like you know we made this show with Cesar Gates he was the Schwitters uh, recipient uh, Res, uh, Schwitters prize uh, awardee but um I somehow feel you cannot you know like it's a different situation in the states as it is here and somehow there's always a danger that you kind of become a token for something and then it's like so politically correct that you you're again in another you know framing that you don't want to be in um so I guess my 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 question is perhaps towards your the reception of your work because you have shown also in um, in the Julia Stoschek collection and um, so was it different somehow or do you feel you know it's different working in in Europe than it is in the United States um, yeah perhaps you could talk to that a little bit well showing a Julia Stoschek was mostly different from not showing at all that's what it was. Yeah preeminently different from, because I didn't have very much exhibition history prior to, you know, five years ago, like this, I can count the instances on my hand, like both hands at least, literally. Uh, so that was the primary difference, like, you know, it was a show versus being a non-show. Um, I don't like, I don't get like all this kind of stuff, the market and this kind of stuff. Well, yeah, that's going to be the case because it's the case with all artists. It's not just black artists, it's white artists, black artists, European artists, everybody, everybody in the market is a factor. It's not going to not be there. Uh, I tend to, as long as I'm making what I want to make, I don't really care about it too deep. You know, I don't spend a whole lot of energy where I don't, I'm not wringing my hands about the market, you mm -hmm. know. I don't mind being a token as long as I'm a token of success. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> the other kind of stuff I don't I don't care about. I don't like yeah. somebody wants to put me in a black show. Yeah, it happens. There's a sh traveling show right now that I'm in that I don't even know how I ended up in it. Like mm -hmm. I just saw it on Instagram and it it did disturb me a little bit, but mostly because I just didn't like the work of the other artists that were in the show, not because they were black. There's a ton of black artists. I mean, I try not to do that too much. Like I try not to get into, oh, I don't want my work to be seen in the context of X, Y, and Z because I don't think that work mm -hmm. is good or something like that. Because that's just so relative, first of all. It's like, I try to make work that will stand, stand on its own. It don't matter where like you show it. Like love is the message. I remember Earl Nelson somebody say, hey, do you mind if we show love is the message? in such and such. I don't care if Love is Mess shows at a Klan rally. As long as they don't change my edit, it's <laughs> cool with me. You know what I'm saying? Because it says and does what it's going to do. As long as they don't alter my edit, I kind of don't give a fuck, honestly. You know? Because I made things, so I try to make things so that they are, they have a lot of ontological integrity. You know, they are what they are. Like, I increasingly, and I've said this before, too, I'm just not, I'm increasingly not interested in good or bad. I mean, so often curators come to me, it's like I've learned, it's just been like the same lesson over and over. You go into these museums, the first thing you do when they get there, they're so happy to have you there, and then they start telling you how it's got to go. And oh, so you really? say, how it's got to go, how it's got to okay. be. Okay. Mm -hmm. Registrars and all this. And then you say, well, I don't want that. I want this. And then they say, well, you can't do that. Okay. The first time I heard that, I was like, why can't I do this? 
But like one effect of having the same show travel over and over and over and over again into all these different, couldn't be more different venues and stuff, is that I know now when people tell me it can't be, I'm like, don't even waste your breath. Don't finish it because it can be because it already has been and it already will be. So don't tell me it can't be. Let's just cut to the chase. Mm -hmm. It's one, it's three or four things. It can be because there's no money. Sometimes mm -hmm. institutions are afraid of that. They don't like saying that. But I'm just like, okay, this is cut to the chase. How much is it going to cost? If it's not $20,000, I'll pay for it. I want it the way I want it to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not any time. Okay, the time thing is fundamentally because they don't want to spend the money because money is time, time is money. So it's like, they keep telling you it's not the money if you press them so that you can run out of time. So you can get to the next thing where they can say, well, it's, it would have been doable if we had done it a week ago, but now there's just not enough time because the show is opening X, Y, Z. Okay, I don't care about the show opening because the show opening is like a little sliver of the existence of the show. So I don't, we, you know, I don't care about the opening. I don't care. I don't care at all. I just want the thing to be what I want it to be. So money, time. And then they'll say, if you get past those two, they'll say, oh, uh, because we just don't do it that way. This restaurant, why can't we do it? Because that's not the way we do it. Okay, that's not the way, way you do it, but a bunch, that's the worst. You know, by the time they get to it, it's just not the way we do it. Boom, okay, I don't care about that. I don't care about how y'all do it. I care about how I do it, so boom. And then if you get through all of those, the final one is always is, we just want the show to be good. And I always stop people right there saying, I don't care if it's good or bad. I do not care. I don't care if it's bad according to you or good according to somebody else. It's out of my frame. I just want to make things that are things that have, as I say, ontological integrity that are what they are. It's like Mount Kilimanjaro. Is that a good mountain or a bad mountain? It's absurd. It's not a good mountain or a bad mountain. It is a mountain. You have to go around it, over it, under it, through it, something, but it stands its ground. I just want to make work like that. I don't care about all this other stuff. Yeah, I care. I want money in my bank, but when it's making the thing, I don't, I, all this other stuff, I don't, I don't really care about it. It's very frustrating for me to hear it now. It's like Groundhog Day. It's like, oh my God, I'm in the matrix. It's the same fucking conversation. I'm waiting for people to come up with some other reason, some other reason why I can't do what I asked to do. Come up with a new reason. Don't keep telling me the same. It's like, do y'all trade notes on this shit or what? Y'all got the same four reasons over and over and over again. Okay, so you now you have to promise me to work with me again. Uh, it seems to be like a real challenge. No, no, I'm, I'm joking. It's not but a challenge. It's yeah, like, I'm easy. I'm easy. Yeah, no, like somebody said, you can't put a wall here. I'm like, I'm not talking about a diamond wall. I'm just talking like you got walls over the place. Put the wall up. Why can't we put the wall up? It's going to be $500. For real? You could have just said that the first time. Let's just put the wall up where I want it. It's going to make the show better. This is the whole thing. I can't, I'm like not doing anything. I'm not in here trying to make the show worse. I'm in here trying to make the show better. I want it to be a better experience for people. So like, let's, let's work together. Don't, don't set up a bunch of hurdles to make the show less good because you're uneasy. Don't even approach me. If you're uneasy, I'm not the one to approach. Go get a paint or something. You could just hang the shit. And you ain't, you ain't got to worry about it. But if you want to work with me, I want to, sometimes I get bored with the way the thing has been done before. I'm not unreasonable. I'm super reasonable, actually. Mm, I know. And um, I make a cut here. And I want to ask you, because I remember going with you to Christopher Street Bookstore. What are you reading at the moment? Are you reading like many books at the same time? Yeah, many books and reading them, you know, partially. I don't, my son, 16 year old, told his mom, because we were saying, you're not reading enough. She's like, dad never reads. And she almost fell out of her chair. She was like, your, da your dad is like a legendary reader, consumer of books and stuff. But uh, but I realized I had been working so hard that I definitely wasn't reading as much. Or he didn't see me with a book in my hand too often. Oftentimes, like a lot of, I'm reading stuff online now. But, but um, I mean, I read like recently, 
less I read than I heard uh, was shared with me a podcast with this graphic designer, uh, David Rudnick. That's, mm -hmm. I think he gave a, well, he gave a talk at Stelka, which I guess was some sort of graphic design conference in, in Russia or something. Mm -hmm. The talk was all right, but the podcast that he did, and I'm forgetting, if, if you Google it, it'll come up, but David Rudnick. It's a, um, it's a long conversation, almost three hours long. And he's talking with the, um, on the podcast about all this stuff in some ways that has, is bubbling around NFTs and this kind of stuff, you know, uh, non-fungible tokens. And, you know, people did this auction, it was $69 million. And where are we at now? And it's such an incredible, like, framing of some of what's at stake. Like he was saying, there are the people who are what they call digital prime versus mm -hmm. physical prime. And the schism between the two is like, it's, it really is going to shape what the future is going to look like, because this is something that we've been rapid, rapidly approaching. Like, what is the real world? You know, there's an architectural theorist named Carl Chu, who I always like reading. He, he said something years ago that always stuck with me. He said, the virtual, what we call the virtual, is an in-between space between the real and the imagined. And that was such a provocative way for me to think about it for so long. I'm not even sure it may have evolved past that now, but I think what we're talking about is the erasure of certain kinds of boundaries and stuff. And we're just seeing it play out in terms of the market and artifacts and this kind of stuff. Like a lot of people have called me and said, are you gonna make an NFT offering because your work would seem ideally suited to it because it's digital or something like that, or it's in the, you know, like the videos are digital, I guess, or something, you would seem to be ideally suited to it. And I, and I kind of like, I kind of get it on a certain level because there's a certain aspect, like if you have something like love is a message, can you really own it? Like, how can you, do you really own it? Like, and now with blockchains and all this kind of stuff, a person mm -hmm. could literally own it. But it's really more like the market implications of it is what everybody is like, seems to be in the fallout of it. But what David Rudnick kind of is getting at is like, it's way, way deeper than that. It's like super, super, super way deeper than that because it really does come down to what is gonna be real. Like what is the real at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. Like what's the real? And, um, and that's a really profound and not easily answerable question, you know? Like he was saying one thing that was very interesting. He was talking about his typefaces because he's known for designing typefaces. And he was saying the reason he likes to draw his own typefaces is because for him, the content of a string of alphabets or letters that create a sentence <clears throat> is like, you know, that's one thing, but the voice is something else. It's kind of like, I, I use it now as like Aretha Franklin. Sure, Carol King's, uh, you make me feel like a natural woman. That's a great song with great lyrics and stuff. But even Carol King knows that her singing it is very different from Aretha Franklin singing it, you know? Even though she didn't compose those ideas, she didn't com compose those that string of thoughts, but her voice, the, and so what David Rudnick was saying, he draws tight faces because to him, that's the way the voice enters. Now the voice, in a way you could say, is the body. So the question is like, how does the body enter these spaces that are not meat space, that are not physical space, that are not material space? And like for me, one of the reasons that's fascinating to me just cause, and it's really bound up in a lot of my, my preoccup aesthetic preoccupations and stuff is this whole idea that, and it's again, another instance, conception in this instance of mining this catastrophe that I'm talking about. Like if you look at where black people are strong expressively, it tends to be in a space that I would term immaterial invention, mm -hmm. music, dance, oratorical things, right? And mm -hmm. I've said this a thousand times, but Nam June Paik has this great quote where he says, the culture that's gonna survive in the future is a culture you can carry around in your head. And I think if you look at black cultural expression, it's a perfect, massive experimental version of that because where we are strong are in the places where we could carry the culture on our nervous systems meaning on a slave ship on a plantation on a chain gang on in a prison it's mm -hmm. on our nervous system singing song dance things like that now 
one of the few things in Africa, in Africa and the continent that's as rich and as diverse as musical expression is actually material expression. It's one of the few places where that is absolutely true. There's as many sculptures and paintings and things, artifacts as the music. As a matter of fact, and I've said this a zillion times too, there's no contemporary Western art without that. If you take that out of the equation, this shit, this shit looks nothing like it looks like the environment is an alien environment. It doesn't look anything like what our world looks like. Mm -hmm. Even though it's typically not acknowledged, it's only partially acknowledged. Oh, Picasso, Durain, these people, they saw X, Y, and Z and it had some impact. But generally they think it, they try to, they try to confine it to like a kind of formal uh, impact of form or something like that. Mm -hmm. It very seldom is dealt with on the level of aesthetic practice, this process and stuff like that. But let me take my word for it. Is if you take that out of the equation, this shit doesn't look anything like it looks. So it's amazing given that if you accept the idea that in Africa, there are as many and as diverse and as powerful and as beauty instances of material expressivity as there are immaterial or sound expressivity or dance expressivity. But when you look at the descendants of Africans who were brought to the Americas who become black people, that is not the case. It's no accident to me that John Michelle's parents are Haitian and Puerto Rican. That is no accident. It's not, it's not, it's not an arbitrary, irrelevant fact. I'm not saying he was great because his parents were Haitian and you know mm. and Puerto Rican, but those are societies in which black material expressivity had more, there was more space for it, mostly because as Cornel West sort of alluded to, those are Catholic societies and not Protestant societies. Most black churches are Protestant churches. So their relationship to visuality is what you see in a Protestant church versus the Catholic church. I was raised Catholic, but that's very, very unusual, you know, in the context of black people in America. Most black people are brought up in Protestant churches mm -hmm. and it wouldn't, it would be one thing if you were talking about a neutral environment and you were in a Protestant church, that would be one thing, right? But this was anything but a neutral environment. It's an anti-Black white supremacist environment that we've come up in. So the church was the only sanctuary. It was the only thing like an institution that we had. So because the church it created a space of subsidy and support for the vocal stuff, the dance stuff, the oratorical stuff, the stuff that we carried on our nervous systems, but whatever the residue of the material expressivity that it may have offered subsidy for or support of, there was no place for it because those were Protestant churches or it's very narrowly parameterized. It's not like in a, like imagine if the black church in America was a Catholic church. Can you imagine all the shit people would have carved and painted over the last several hundred years, that material expressivity, which is always around on the margins, would have been front and center, just like the music, just like the dance, just like the oratorical stuff, but that's not the case. So it's really interesting to me to think about this whole question of like, cause clearly there's a tsunami of black visual artists happening now. And people ask me about it like, Okay, there was always a bunch of people there. It's not like there was not people there. They were just kept out. There's been a, um, a dam. It's been a dam for the last, at least in the last century, for sure. There was a dam. Like prior to the 20th century, it wasn't anything you had to worry about so much because if Black people are basically chattel slavery, you're just not worrying about them painting. Mm. We can't even control where you sleep, who you have sex with, who you reproduce with. Paintings are the last thing on your mind. You don't even control your own body. How can you control other material? Again, the dance, the song, those things are on your nervous system. You do those things. Those things evolve in response even to the context in which you find themselves. Mm. Spirituals, blues, jazz, funk, all these other things come out of that. But the painting thing, does not that's not a worry. But once post-reconstruction in the context of America. Once you have a little space, people have a little leisure time, they have a little uh, material, they can control material a little bit, and they start to express themselves materially, then that wall goes up. And that wall has been like a dam keeping all these Black people out of the space of the fine arts. Because outside of music, 
fine arts is Europe, the European cultural space par excellence. It's like the space where, you know, I, the European uh, superiority of the things is on display. I used to be very angry when I was younger as a black person. And when I went to the Louvre, I was like, fuck these mm -hmm. white people, fuck this painting. But after about 10 minutes, you're like, kind of like, damn, they kind of did this shit. This shit is kind of fucking intense. It's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of like listening to Jimi Hendrix or something. You know what I mean? It was like, damn, this shit is kind of intense. The weight of it, the complexity of it is undeniable. So of course it's a space, it's retained. It's like they don't, the whole thing has been to keep women and people of color out of this space. So we have a lot to say. It's not just that we have some skills, our circumstances by the very nature of our lives are incredibly complex and uh and um and uh and uh not just sometimes tragic but you know phantasmagoric like our circumstances are phantasmagoric that kind of stuff makes for good art mm -hmm. it makes for good cinema like we have a zillion stories to tell but you have to be allowed there has to be space for you to tell those stories so i just think that's where we're at now it's just like mm -hmm all of a sudden there's like a tidal wave, a tsunami coming. And I, I even reject the whole idea that it's, um, we're trying to hold it down for white people, white civilization, and then all these people in, you know, non-white people at the boundaries, there's these black, with the epitome of that being black, you know, not in between black, the extreme, at the way, at the walls, coming in to encroach and contaminate our space, right? But the thing is, is like, this is certainly true of Black people. I like to say, we are, we are the ill sons. We are the ill sons and daughters of this shit. This shit is not us. It's us too. Because we're the products of rape. Western civilization, we are the heirs of Western civilization. We may not look like y'all, but look, it's a little bit like the return of the repressed. It's like, yo, it's like we're a bunch of hungry, orphaned, angry people out here who have the, like Picasso, forget Picasso, Cezanne, you know, go, you can go back to Free Angelico, Simba Bowie, you can go back as far as you want to go. That's my history. I can, if I want to track back, I can track through the black people and find the white person and then boom, just like anybody else who's white, who maybe never even picked up a brush, but they can say, oh, my ancestor was you know what I mean? Giotto or whatever, right? I have just as much claim to that by virtue of the fact that they are white people, whatever that is, the, the, the metaphysics of that, you know what I mean? But I'm saying I, inside of that metaphysics, I have just as much access to that. I'm the product of that too. I'm just the product of all this other shit as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. AJ, thank you so much. Uh, I, I couldn't, you, I couldn't I agree more, you. but... <laughs> so, but... Uh, I mean, there there could be questions, but I think people are so overwhelmed, and we have made it so long. Uh, well, Christina, your big dear colleague says, "Thank you for the generous insight. You made my day to listen to you." And other people shared the podcast, so somebody already found it. David Rutnick, you say, right? Yeah. Um, so that's good. I'm going to listen to it, and um, yeah, I mean, if there are no more questions, I don't know. Um, well, I, I think it was such a great statement now. Um, I don't even dare to, to interrupt it with a new question because, uh, you know, like, uh, oh, there is a question. Uh, no, no, it was perfect. Thank you. Okay. So I get, uh, <laughs> so it's perfect. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Sorry. I have to see. Thank you. Now, I think we are like, uh, we are here and I, I know you, you need to cut. Um, I thank you really much for your time. And I, I hope we're going to meet very soon in person again. I don't know if you ever make it to you. I Europe. just got my vaccine. So I'm like, Sorry? I think I'm going to be around for a second. I've been like, yeah, Kung Fu fighting COVID for, you know, like everybody else. For yeah. The yeah, I mean, it would be great if you can see the show. I mean, they're also very interesting, you know, like very, uh, I mean, there's Anmi Lee, for example, a photographer, and she's um, born in Vietnam in the show. And, and she is, uh, she used to take pictures of uh, uh, maneuvers of uh, American, US American military. So 
So that was her way to deal with her own history and somehow to, to become a really known photographer. I don't know if her, her but, um, but so the show is all about, you know, like also asking this elementary question and Gustav Metzger being one artist who has, you know, somehow the same approach as you say, you know, I don't give a shit like about what you think a museum is, what the limits are. So, but I, I just want to talk about, you know, like, like my my existence, others' existence, and really about the uh, you know the most important things of survival and how we deal with what what we have and how we can go on. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I will I, have. I got one I, last thing I guess I can say on the going. If that's sorry, all right. sorry, somebody wants to hear about your future projects. Givu T, who's also an artist uh, from Cameroon in Belgium, who's. Uh, um, he made um, photographs of the jungle in Calais, and Guy is online, and he asks, he would like to know what you're working on, what you're doing. I'm working on this piece right now. I'm, I'm now you're frozen. You're freezing. Excuse me? Sorry. Uh, I'm working on this piece called Aghidra. Aghidra. A-G-H-D-R-A. Aghidra. Mm -hmm. a -A, a and mm -hmm. it should be showing... <laughs> If I can, you know, get it finished, it should be showing at, it'll be as part of the show that's in uh, Louisiana now. And then maybe, maybe like in the States, like later, we, we're talking about it now. And it definitely is like uh, very uh, different from anything, you know, that I've done up until this point. In some ways in response to, um, you know, all this stuff that people are saying about what I do. Like it's archival and it's this. So I just decided to make something that could not be interpreted by any, you know, stretch of the imagination as archival. It's like the opposite of archival. <laughs> okay. yeah. But also hoping to do, effectively speaking, all the things that I think, you know, some of my work does, like to be, you know, the creator Cecil Taser that might say new intensities. You're trying to generate new kinds of intensities. And so. Well, thank you so much, AJ. Have a beautiful day and thank hope you. to see you soon. Uh, it was a great pleasure to have you and to hear. And uh, I will never talk about archival again, but I understand what you mean. Um, so looking forward. Please. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you, Leslie. Bye bye.